I'm pleased to be with you today. This is an honor to be in this church. I love this church and I love to serve in this church. And I did come to visit um, be, during uh, Pastor's immense ministry. I just want to start with a confession. I never liked how I looked and I never liked my name either. Amal is my relative. I have uh, four siblings, or we're four siblings. <laughs> Everyone else had normal name. I ended up with a different name. Can you imagine Pastor Hisham in Egypt? Doesn't sound very uh, appealing. I also lived in an area that um, uh, that had lots of bars and things like that. So can you imagine Pastor Hacham and that coming from that area? I've also never really liked how I looked and I've always wondered if God, uh, why God couldn't have made me look a little bit better. This went on until I got struck by a verse uh, from the Apostle Paul who said, God who loved me. It was the first time I grasped that there is someone who would love you despite how you look, where you come from, or anything else in your life. So back to that verse, God who loved me. I understand that the last two years had been hard for everyone. We lost lots of people that are dear to us. There were different kinds of losses. People lost loved ones, but they also lose, lost their jobs. So I wanted to start with you in Ecclesiastes. We don't really visit that book in the Bible. It's not a popular one, but highly recommend that you turn to that book. If you don't have your Bible, open your holy cell phone or look at the holy screen, whatever you prefer. In that book, Ecclesiastes, I need you to be very alert. Um, today is is going to be today and tomorrow is going to are going to be based on on that verse. It says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Therefore, just one minute here. What does he want to tell us? He wants to tell us that in our life, God who created everything, he has times and has seasons. So everything it has a time and everything has season. This is very important to understand. I might need to come back uh, a different time to go through uh, different seasons or different times. There is a season for love. There is a time in our life when God um, knocks the door for everyone and tries to attract everyone to Him. Because the very one very common lie is that God does not love you. We go through hard time and then the lie goes, if God loves you, this wouldn't have happened. The most common lie that Satan spreads throughout the world is that God doesn't love you. But the Bible says that there is a time for or a season for love. And there is a time for God when he searches for us. 
I think in the time of COVID, God was shaking the foundations to wake people up. And some people understood that and some people didn't. There is a time for redemption where everyone that everything that got lost is redeemed. If you are a believer, you try and see through the circumstances and understand the purposes of each of those times and seasons. In verse 2, it talks about time for birth and time for death. This is something that comforts me personally. God knows the day I was born and God knows the day I was, I'm going to die. And then he says, for killing, there's time, there's time for healing, there's go back to the full chapter and Solomon will list that everything that happens in our life has a time and each of that falls under the umbrella of the season that we live in. So how do we grasp God's purposes for us in each of those seasons? God, using his Holy Spirit, it tells us how in verse 11. We sh this is a very important verse to understand how God would work in the different circles we're in. It says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. I want you to be sure that nothing is happening in your life or has happened in your life that was not part of that what the verse is saying god is not a tempter he does not test us he does not tempt us with evil we ask why god allows something to happen he keeps asking why and why and why but if we understand that everything is beautiful in its time we a lot of times we pray for things to happen in our time in our preferred ways and god says this is not how it works i know exactly what you need i know what you want but i'm going to do things in my own time so this and this is a very crucial verse and it turned my life upside down it said he has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So what, it, what he is trying to tell us, to be able to understand God's intervention and providence, um, we'd have to understand it or grasp it within the eternity that God has placed in our life. So whoever looks at and considers eternity and accepts it as a fact is able to better grasp what God is doing in its own time. So f for everything and every has, has a time or season. We hear time runs fast. Did you ever see someone who is holding his phone on a train station and the train leaves without him getting on there are a lot of times that people are so busy and the life train runs fast and they never get on so today i want to tell talk to you about a new beginning we know that um, we have lots of different background different circumstances and challenges when we go through a challenge, we think it's the end of everything. I, I think that God wants to want to do with you and with this church a new beginning. Let's go to a magnificent uh, passage in uh, Isaiah 6. I know that you're familiar with these passages and you probably have it memorized. But I, I would 
try and be very concise to see what God wants to do in our time. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, you can remove the word Uzziah and name the person that you've lost or your business that you are lost or whatever circumstance that challenged you and replace, replace it and put it in that part of the verse. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seating on the throne, and above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, and two they covered their feet. And they were calling to another, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty, and the whole earth was full of glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold sush, and the temple was filled. And he said, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had t taken from the altar. With, with it he touched my mouth and said, See, this touch your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who shall go for us? It's taken I want you to take a minute for prayer and ask God and say, even though I have heard those verses before, I want you to talk to me tonight. Lord, we all come to you today asking you like Samuel, Samuel to speak to us because we are listening. We are all burdened with lots of hurt and pain and sadness inside of us. We come with busy minds and stressful minds. But I thank you because you're the only one who's able to say, come to me and I will give you rest. You're the only one who said, come as you are, I love you. It says about Jesus that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion over them and he opened his mouth and taught them. We're asking you to come and teach us and to open your mouth with a new message, with a new fire from the Holy Spirit in each one, each one of us and each one who's listening to us. Come and transform our hearts and let us understand the times that we are living in. To you be all glory. Amen. From two years ago, I, 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 I personally uh, drive our media team crazy in our church. In, in, uh, in about two years ago, I had uh, two, multiple funerals. Um, my mother-in-law and... Um, and my father-in-law, and then another person in the church, her name is Maha. Maha is in her early 50s. Uh, she was a vibrant servant. Uh, she Her energy is equal to 20 people. Anything I need or require, or the church requires, she will go and do it. She had placed her hands in a lot of ministries, Sunday school, and whatever we are doing, she will go and try and help as much as she can. One day, a family from Egypt asked her to buy a laptop to send to Egypt for their son to attend university. When she was, she delivered the laptop and while she was crossing the road, uh, she got hit by a car and she died. I wanted to reflect on the last conversation I had with her. 
4 a.m. the day she died, she sent me a message on my cell phone. She said, Pastor, Pastor, we have pas another pastor who's visiting. What can we do so we can make sure that a lot of the Arab people living in our area uh, are able to know about it and come? Well, you, got, you know that um, as a pastor, my cell phone is always turned on. So I asked her, how come you're up to just tell me uh, to talk to me about this? So she answered back that God kept her awake um, so that she can pray for all the lost souls and for that event. So I texted back, why not? you go back to sleep and when you woke up uh, we would talk about it the last thing she wrote back is pastor there's no time to waste and then she was gone home to heaven in the year of death of maha in the year death of the pastor in the year of the death of king Uzziah. Sometimes when something big like this happens, we think life stops. Isaiah, Isaiah went to inside the temple many, many times. He's a great prophet. He went to the temple many times. From one, from chapter one to chapter six, he never he saw everyone as sinner. But in that year, I. They had built a lot of hopes on the King Uzziah as a way of salvation. But in that year where the people where Uzziah died and the hope is lost, Isaiah went to the temple and he saw God. He went to the temple before that many, many times. But only in that year, for the first time, despite the fact that he was a prophet and despite the fact that he had visited the temple many times, this time when I went inside the temple, when my heart is crushed, when the tears are flowing, I saw God. And I want to tell you the same thing. It, you might have attended church hundreds of times. You heard lots of sermons. You sit at, in front of the TV and you listen to sermons. There is a lot whole of difference between seeing the Lord and hearing about Him. Here, Isaiah saw God sitting, which is like saying, I am still in control. This is what sitting refers to. As I'm sitting, I am in control of all events. Sometimes we only see right under our feet, but it says, but God says, don't be afraid. We know that above the um, there is always someone who's higher above the high official there's always someone higher he is the highest authority of all and that's exactly what Isaiah needed to see and remember during those circumstances he's not just sitting but he was sitting and and elevated it is to say, I know everything about your life and your circumstances. I'm in control. I know, I know when to intervene. His, his presence filled the place. Do you feel God's presence in the church? Do you, are you aware of it when you, when you go to your own uh, room and close the door and have your devotion time. Do you uh, become aware of the presence of the Lord? It's a lot different than just hearing about him. The testimony of Isaiah is is supernatural. It is the time 
when he felt the worst that he had a new revelation of God. The disciples went with Jesus and they saw over the mountain and they saw Elijah and then it said that suddenly they could only see Jesus alone and sometimes that's what God wants us to focus on he wants to tell us don't put your hopes on government on laws or power or anything I want you to put your eyes on or set your eyes on me the second thing you can see in this passage that God did in this passage the God revelation of himself like we sang is holy 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 it's as if God is telling you when your eyes are opened I want you to see me that way what does it mean that God is holy we all repeat this sentence God loves the sinner but he hates sin and as Christians living uh, as immigrants we have a problem if we if you have friends like that are Jews or Muslims uh, you'll find that your friends teach their children that as a Jew I cannot do this or that or as a Muslim you can't do so and so the only kind of parents who let go of teaching their kids what it means to be a Christian are Christians we have we would say oh we don't want to get them uptight and and do you notice that all the activities all the sports happen on Sunday there is a plan to destroy um, sort of that f Christian tradition I need you to be aware as parents and if you claim that you're Christians that we are distinct because we are the children of the king you have to teach your kids that it's okay to be different it's okay to be distinct because we follow God because we have a Bible that rules us and sets the boundaries by the way Christianity does not have a law or Sharia it has it offers us a savior who is Jesus Christ what governs us in our relationship is not a set of rules we don't have that we have do you love Jesus or no is he dwelling in your heart or no I've been living in the U.S. since eight, the year 1988. This is the first time, time to see that the U.S. celebrates with um, any sort of event for an entire month. For an entire month, we have a celebration even though it does not reflect uh, the ideology of five more than five percent of the people now we have your uh, children who's staying in front of uh, social media and getting exposed to different material i don't know how many of you heard about the disney ceo situation who had said that she wanted to produce more LGBTQ material so you have children getting exposed to unbiblical teachings in school and unbiblical teaching in social media 
if we don't wake up to that, this generation is going to um, be lost. This is the time that the church and the parents um, unite. Why would a child leave a, a Disney movie to come to the church if we don't develop our ministry for kids? Uh, they're not going to come. Uh, I get a lot of parents who say, I don't know what to do. Uh, and then I would tell them, uh, you can at least pray. We can uh, pray to for protection from spiritual darkness. We are not weak. As Christians, um, we're not weak. Being in the Middle East, we were taught that we are weak. We, we are very complacent. The true church that has the presence of the Lord uh, as the one in the, uh, in the book of Acts says that there is fear in people around them because the church was alive the culture was afraid of the um, church even though it was a persecuted church now we can't protect our, even our own kids it is true you deal with a God who loves loves the sinner and he's able to uh, and he was willing to die for a sinner but he's not going to accommodate for sin and that's what uh, Isaiah discovered. This is why after the angels shouted, holy, 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 he said, woe to me, I am a unclean man living with unclean pe people. This statement uh, really amazed me. You know why? Because in chapter 1, uh, he condemns he condemns everyone else around him and then the next chapters he predicts lots of judgment and condemnation it's like chap um, Isaiah is looking to see that everyone is sinner except him until he himself stood before God I want to tell you that that person who um, talks negatively about others, he never sat in front of, in the presence of God. Because when Isaiah sat in the presence of God, he realized how sinful he is. When we measure ourselves uh, or compare ourselves to others, it's easy to feel okay about ourselves. As long as you feel okay, you feel you're better. But when you sit in the presence of God, it's totally different. It's woe to me. You're Isaiah. No, 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 it doesn't matter. I was not aware of how holy God is. It, it, you could have, you could be falling in different sorts of sins but from what I could see is that the most common sin believers fall in nowadays is the sin of unforgiveness this is the most common one that we do almost willingly and long time ago when we um, when we uh, got married, your mo your future mother-in-law would say, you have to buy the china closet or cupboard. I know that every, every Arabic country would have something. So yeah, it's the china cabinet. In Egypt, you'd always have to buy uh, a china cabinet. And in my days, a China cabinet, you would kept 
things in like cups or plates and and no one could touch or come close to that china cabinet it was something that was untouchable and you never used it but still people wanted insisted to have it and every one of us has uh, something like a china cupboard that is full of wounds that we have closed it up because we don't want to get hurt again and because we are surrounded in these wounds from lots of different sources we're full of those wounds but because we are scared of them and we're afraid to get hurt again, we locked everything up in that china cabinet. This is why we can't live right or enjoy our lives. Because out of that part comes bitterness and you remember everything um, that happened to you. This is one of the most dangerous sins to fall in. We, we pray our Lord's prayer, prayer every time and we say that we forgive other sins but I know sometimes that this is not the case. So I wanted to really bring the attention of my listeners to that sin, the sin of unforgiveness. So Isaiah needed to repent. He needed to stand before God and say, God, please forgive me forgive me for judging people forgive me for not being able able to see your hands in the different times this is why the bible says that when you come with a heart seeking repentance and change immediately it says in the bible that the angel came with the life goal to touch his lips this is the work of grace. He's, God is the only one who's able to tell you uh, your sins are forgiven. He's the one who's able to say that he wiped away our sins. Your sins I won't remember anymore. So imagine if I lied today and I repented. And if I fall again in the sin of lying, God sees it as if I had sinned the one time. Not like us, when we say, oh, again, you did it again? Do you want the list of the f that happened 15 years, through the 15 years? This happens because we close up on our wounds. But God, on the other hand, he says, your sins I no longer remember how he says if we confess our sins he is just and faithful and I want to tell you that as evangelicals we've lost the discipline of confession we don't confess our sins we are the generation of Jesus took my sins and threw it in the sea It's not that simple. The Bible is clear. It says, if we, if we confess our sins. So every one of us is required every day to confess their sins and ask for forgiveness. When was the last time as a church that we came and confessed our sins that we left sinners or that we made problems and we were occupied by our uh, own preferences or ways when you hear holy 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 you will you will automatically say I cannot stand before you how do I stand before you 
but immediately you will hear, I love you, I forgive you. Like the angels did. He took the call and he touched his lips and it was forgiven. So I wanted to tell, to emphasize the salvation that Jesus offers is eternal. Whenever you accept him as Lord and Savior, your name is written in the book of life. And once it is written, it's never wiped away. Your, your transgressions have been removed. So from now on, Satan has no power over you. He may like be like a dog who is angry, but his leash is held by Jesus himself. Pastor, but the light, but the war is so heated and hard. Well, learn to stand up to it and learn to use the name of Jesus. The most powerful name is the name of Jesus, and that's the name we stop using. This is why we in the US and you guys tend to follow. I don't know why, but when Obama was the president, he said, it's okay, you can, you can, uh, you can decorate your house with you can decorate your house, you can decorate your house, you can buy gifts, but you don't have to bring the name of Christ. Just say happy holidays. What's, what's the problem? Uh, well, this is not a new problem. Uh, if you remember, when Peter and the disciples started to do miracles, it said that they took him, took them, and they hit them and they told them not to say that name why because the name of jesus is the only name that scares satan you want protection over your family your kids when they're going to school just declare the pro protective power of Jesus, Jesus' name over them. This is why the salvation of God, of Jesus is final. He paid it all. He paid it all on the cross. The last thing I want to say is not that, not just you see God, not just that you realize your sinner and not just uh, you also hear God saying who do I send how many of you is ready to be sent to receive a new mission from God oh pastor we're too old let the youth take over I've been 40 years as a pastor, so you have to expect that I can tell you things I've heard. As long as you're breathing, God has a mission for you. As long as you're breathing, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have anything for you, so he keeps you. He has a plan for you. He wants to use you in extraordinary ways. When, when you die, then that's over. But as long as you are breathing and you're alive, God wants to use you. But God is looking for a heart that is on standby. We, however, how many of us are doing that? We all have busy lives. We have stressful life. Work takes up all of our work. We, we have to work hard. 
so that you can uh, take care of your family so we all struggle to live a better life to grow in our career to have better guarantee for the future and we forgot that we are foreigners and aliens living and we forgot that God has a calling over our life do you, do you know why you're living in Canada? Do you, do you? The first time I came to Edmonton, I realized I didn't even know about Edmonton. Do you, do you know why God sent you to Edmonton? It's because God has a plan and he's asking, who do I send? I have a mission for Edmonton or for Canada but God is looking for five or six believers who are willing to say here I am sent me Lord my work in your kingdom is is the most important thing that's what God is looking for this is not just sermon talk or sermon or pastor talk but the best thing is going to help you sleep is to be in the will of God and that you are fulfilling God's will in your life even Jesus says that it was his pleasure to do the will of God the my father-in-law I told you I told you in the beginning that her, my mother-in-law passed then Maha then um, my father-in-law so whenever we lose someone who is young we always wonder why being a pastor i've always been in the position that to deliver bad news so now imagine that i have to drop news on the family that someone died and every time i had to tell the news Um, I was worried that someone would have an accident on their way to the hospital. But do you know why God left my father-in-law to the last minute? In the last two months, he went to the nursing home eight to nine times. He went, he would go there, then he would get sick then go back to the hospital and so on do you believe that in the nine times he was transferred to the nursing home nine people believed in Jesus Christ Ragei who lost his wife Maha and they would go to visit their dad and their dad would talk to his uh, roommate and they would call me asking me to come to the nursing home to talk to the person who gave up his life to Jesus Christ and there was one time where he ended up with the same person twice it's because that person did not give up his life the first time and then the second time he would god has a mission for your life your life is very important to him and it, like the tree when the fruit is ripe he never let it fall on the ground he would take it so when do i leave earth when when my work is done do you know your mission here it's not just about living and owning things or eating or drinking i have no problem with material blessings 
My problem is I want you to live what God wants you to live. And that happens when you see God and feel his presence. I want you to ask God to see him, to be in his presence, to give you joy and peace that he is in control of all things and so that when he also reveals a sin in your life that you repent. Let's repent. Um, let's also repent of unintentional sins. Maybe, maybe you're perfect and you don't sin, but maybe you have done things unintentionally and hurt someone. And then you could hear his voice that he had removed all our trans transgressions. So that when you also hear, who do I send? You would have your hand raised up and say, Lord, send me. Let's sing, let's sing that song that, t that says, we repent before you and we come to you, our Father. Whoever is able to do it, I need you to sing it from your heart, not just as a song. I want you to sing that you repent, that you are coming back to your Father that your hearts are worshiping. Tell God that I want to have joy and feel your presence. I want to worship you because I saw you. Uh, you may, I go a lot of churches, I go and see a lot of people around me, but I want to see you. Tell God why just Isaiah, can I also see you? I want you to clean me. I want you to touch my lips the same way you did with Isaiah. I don't want to say hurtful words. I want you to touch my ears, my, touch my eyes. Just touch the whole of me and transform me entirely. We repent before you. We return back to your compassionate hearts. We declare your lordship over our lives, in over our churches and families, our in the hearts of worship. Let's repeat it again. We repent before you. We come back to your compassionate heart. We declare your your lordship over our lives, our homes, and our churches. This is our hope. Our hope is in you. We wait for your promises. We lift our eyes towards you. and our faith in you increases. I believe all of your promises. You, because you are faithful, God. You fill our lives with your goodness. Glory be to you, O King and Helper. Our land is thirsty. filled with wounds from your love fill us your hands would heal it and restore it to you pray for Canada and Canada is thirsty for God's work our hope is in you Lord we will wait for your promises. To you we lift our eyes and our faith in you increases. We trust 
all your promises because you are faithful. You fill our lives with goodness. Glory be to you, our helper. Yeah, more.